Hello friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. If we do not stand up, who will? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to DW's View Stand Up. My sponsor helps keep this podcast on the air. I want to thank my sponsor, Kim Yader, Peak Performance Coach. If you're feeling stuck, in any part of your life, personal or professional, <laughs> if you feel like you just can't move forward, then you need to contact my coach, Kim Yater. Contact Kim at Calendly, C-A-L-E-N-D-L-Y dot com forward slash Kim Yater, Y-E-A-T-E-R. It's okay to be stuck, but it's not okay to stay stuck. Dear friends, to my audience, I wanna thank you for coming each week. I do not take your time for granted. And I thank God that you come each week. Today, I have a very, very special guest, Mr. Neil Mammon. And I wanna thank uh, Mr. Colin Holiday for suggesting Neil. And Neil is a, I'm gonna tell you about him. His, his resume is too long for me to tell you everything, although I would like to. But Neil is a non-hyphenated first generation immigrant. He is an engineer by day, an apologist, defender of the faith by night. He is an ordained evangelical minister. Though Neil's family is predominantly Christian and his grandfather was a lay preacher and very active in the church, Neil's extended family consists of a large number of atheists, Marxists, communists, and social justice activists. And three of his uncles were leaders in the Communist Party, Party in South in India, and one of his uncles was rejected from the Communist Party because he was involved with the church. Then the church rejected him because he was involved with the communists. So he, he kind of got it both ways. Uh, in a family of many socialists and Marxists, Neil said, he is often the black sheep of the family. Now, Neil is a founder of noblindfaith.com, an apologetics, theology, and evangelism ministry. Neil is president of the Values Advocacy Council. He has spoken for the Family Research Council and many, many, many other items and I mean, uh, conferences. Neil's daily Jesus and politics one minute uh, broadcast has been heard in 160 stations around the country. And just one other thing I wanna say about Neil, having a Bible believing father who is a scientist it was, a, it was natural that he and his siblings grew up with a very logical and rational faith. This upbringing led to his research and eventual teaching and writing books on apologetics, theology, and founding the No Blind Faith Ministry. Please help me welcome our, our dear friend, Mr. Neil Mammon. Good morning, Neil. How are you today? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. I don't think I've ever had anyone read my whole bio like that, but thank you. That yeah, I, you good. know, I, I try, I, I cut out a lot of it, I guess. I, I'm <laughs> limited on time. I said, but man, I got to tell. Anyway, I have to tell people, go and read about Neil. Then you'll get the rest of the story. Yeah, usually they say, here's Neil, he's an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but thank but, you. I but you know, that. Neil, your, your resume, your wonderful resume, I would say, is a message to for all of us, and it's an extens- extensive mention of all that, that you've accomplished and you've touched a lot of lives. And I wanna thank you for taking a stand for the gospel and for Jesus Christ. Cause you know, a lot of people say they know him, but not necessarily uh, take a stand like you do. And I wanna um, go ahead and start with, you know, as a first generation uh, immigrant to America, what caused your family Neil to move here to the United States, and how old were you when they moved here? Well, I actually, so uh, I grew up, uh, I was, you know, you didn't get to this, but, uh, and I don't know if you're planning on talking about it, but I was born in Ghana, and then I uh, grew up in Jamaica, Sudan, Yemen, Ethiopia, Mm -hmm. and my parents are ethnically Indian, but culturally I'm African, uh, I mean, it's a mix of African and Indian. and so we were in Yemen, uh, and I was about 18 years old, and I had wanted to come to the U.S. And, and this, is, this is actually a story of how we almost didn't come to the U.S. 
but we were in Yemen and um, I had been working with my parents and we decided that the only way I could come to the US to go to school was if uh, he continued to work where he was, he was working for the government of, of Yemen. And if he continued to work for them and then they could pull out their savings and send me to the States to go to college. So that was the initial plan. But about a couple of months before he, uh, I was supposed to fly out to the US, I had gotten my admission. And this is in the days before email, right? So you had to do it in months in advance. So I'd gotten my um, visa, I'd gotten my tickets, I'd gotten all that stuff. And um, I remember my dad comes into the office and he says that he's been fired. Well, it turns out that a, a coworker of his had committed suicide. And when they went into this coworker's bedroom, they found a Bible with my father's name on it. I have to understand the implications of this. We are in Yemen, Sharia law, right? Mm -hmm. We've lived under Sharia law. We've been living there for six years under Sharia law. Uh, this was a criminal offense. It was not only a criminal offense, the mullahs would, were really, uh, would, if once they found out about it, they would have been after him. So my dad had some students who had graduated and were now in powerful positions in the government. And so they came to him uh, and they said, look, we can, we can save your life if you leave in two weeks, but we can't save your job. So they basically said, um, so my dad said, you, you sent all of us out of the country immediately, like within the next flight. And then he spent the next week and a half packing up stuff and giving it away basically. Cause you, have, you don't have time to ship anything. And then he flew out of there. So that was the first uh, way, the first thing that happened was, and then eventually I did get to the US um, on, my father said, you know, we don't have money, but we're going to see, we go for a year, we have enough money for a year, go for a year, and we'll see what happens. And it turned out that I was able to stay and I was able to work um, as, a, just as a student and things like that. So I came here when I was 18. And then it took me 12 years to get my US citizenship. I had to do everything correctly and everything. And then I brought them over. So in that time, my dad had actually gone back to Sudan. So the Sudanese were like, please come back. <laughs> We'd love to have you back. So he, in a sense, we escaped to Sudan. Now, you understand, back then, Sudan was not the place that we've seen in the history back then. It was actually a very, it was South Sudan, North Sudan, was a very nice place to put be. It wasn't until about 88 that it became the, uh, the war zone that we know of it. Wow. Now, is your dad still living? Yes, he's actually, he lived uh, in the U.S. now. Oh, okay. Okay, great. That's great, man. You you had quite <laughs> quite a life growing up. Now, um, now your grandfather was a Christian, and your father was a communist and an atheist. Um, was the influence of your grandfather was is that what turned him around? I would say no. My dad had a like a he, he sort of had like a vision. He, I mean, he was a professor in physics at the time, and he had a, an encounter with Jesus. Uh, he says, you know, Jesus takes, Jesus takes him all the way from India throughout Africa and finally found him, you know, in Sudan. Uh, he was in Sudan when he became a Christian, the first time we went to Sudan, not the second time, because we, we went to Sudan first and then went to Yemen and then went back to Sudan. So, no, I, in fact, what's interesting is, uh, what's interesting about South Indian Christianity and communism is that Christian, uh, communism actually formed out of the misconcerted con conception of doing good for the poor. So in, in, in South India, a lot of Christians have communistic concepts, they have mm. socialistic concepts. And they take the idea that we're supposed to take care of the poor, and they say, well, if we're supposed to take care of the poor, then therefore our government should take care of the poor, which is a complete violation of the entire concept. But they uh, you know, try explaining that to them. They're not very happy. To, I mean, the reality is quite simple. It comes simply this, and I teach this in a lot of my classes. If, if people look me up and look at um, look up my talk on Jesus is involved in politics, I, I basically say, here's the difference. When you take care of the poor, and the Bible talks about says taking care of the poor, he's talking about the church taking care of the poor. But when you ask the government to take care of the poor, what, what they're really doing is they're forcing people to take care of the poor. And, I, and this is the way I tell the story. I say, look, uh, remember in the Bible, the whole concept of taking care of the poor comes from the Bible, taking care of people you're not related to. In fact, prior to Christian charities, there were no charities. In fact, the Romans themselves said, look, these Christians take care of not only their own poor, but our poor, right? 
Uh, and nobody else had terror. It's un, un, uninterested. In other words, you would never take care. You might take care of somebody who's related to you. You might take care of somebody who you think would help you in the future. You might take care of somebody that you were enslaving so that they would stay enslaved. But, but the idea that you would give money to someone who had nothing to do with you and could never repay you was purely a Christian concept. And so, and that story comes purely from the New Testament. And it comes, I mean, it's in, it's in the Old Testament, by the way, because love your neighbor as yourself yeah. is in Leviticus, in case people you didn't yeah. see that there, but it's in Leviticus. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And in the Good Samaritan, the way I teach this, I say, well, remember the story of the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan uh, sees the guy standing, uh, lying on the side of the road, and he picks him up, puts him on his donkey, and he takes him to the innkeeper. And then he tells the innkeeper, here's some money. When I come back, because I want to be fair, I want you to pay the other half. No, he doesn't say that. Doesn't he? <laughs> right? he doesn't say that. He says, right. oh, and, and the way I teach, I go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. He doesn't say that. What he says is, here's some money. When I come back, I'm going to bring some thugs with big sticks. I'm going to beat up all your neighbors and force them to pay for your name for this poor man. No, no, that's not the story. I, oh, yeah, that's right. Here's the story. He's the, what Jesus said is then the Good Samaritan said to the, the innkeeper, here's some money. When I come back, I'm going to bring the IRS with some badges and guns, and they're going to go to all your neighbors and force them to donate to this man's charity. And everybody goes, no, no, that's not the story. So what did Jesus say? Jesus said, when I come, the man said, when I come back, I will give to you. And what he's saying is that you give to the poor, not for your neighbor. And having the government take care of your neighbor is nothing more than you forcing your neighbor to donate to your preferred charity at the point of an IRS agent's gun. That's what it is. And that's not what the Bible teaches. So socialism and communism actually violate all the principles yes. that the Bible teaches because you cannot force your neighbor to. You should kind of encourage him. You should, you know, you should, uh, we should reward him. You should hug him. You should just say, hey, you know, we should do this together. You should, but you should never send the IRS in and say, no, you got to pay for this guy's. This guy's. Yeah. But that's where Christianity, uh, uh, communism in India kind of arose. And, um, and that's where, so it was interesting because the concept of taking care of the poor was just mutated and that's where we get the communism in South India. So my grandfather actually wasn't opposed to it. He didn't know the concepts behind it. Uh, he was, uh, so he, but he was not a communist. So, so you would actually see Christians who were communists in India. Wow. Yeah. Now, my dad was unusual in that he was a <laughs> atheist. <laughs> but I had a cousin, I have an uncle who was a, the guy, uncle that you mentioned, who was involved in the church. Um, he was a Christian and a communist. Now, over time, uh, those of the first generation sort of stopped being communist, but the second generation continued. So we still have yeah. a few, uh, I wouldn't know, I don't know if they'll call themselves communists anymore, but they're definitely socialists. Oh, man. Now, you know, because you understand the uh, issue uh, more than many, um, how do we conflict, uh, uh, rather confront the influence of socialism and Marxism? Come now, that stuff is creeping into the United States in a big way and destroying, not, as far as I can see, the Constitution and the founding of this country. Uh, Neil? Absolutely. It, the, the problem with um, what we're seeing is, I mean, the problem with confronting socialism is, is really one of education and and i talk in fact tomorrow morning at nine o'clock uh, i think it's 8 30 in fact if you have a link I'll, I'll give it to you that you can post it we have we're talking about critical race theory and in that discussion i show how the marxists came to america in about 1930 hegelian socialists marxist hegelian socialists came and they settled in columbia university and they were called the frankfurt school and from 1930s to now, they've been trying to infiltrate our schools and our colleges and our churches. And lately they've been infiltrating our churches through critical race theory, but they started this. So what's happened is our kids have been brainwashed. Um, you know, John Dewey, Horace Manning, mm -hmm. all these guys right from the beginning have been pushing this into the school system. They're long dead, but their followers mm -hmm. have continued to do that. So the problem is we're, we're, our kids in public schools are learning this. And we are having to deprogram them from it. And so it, it's almost a religion. Uh, so I've, I've encountered uh, socialists and I kind of talk them through stuff that I've talked about and I explain all this. But, it, you know, it's like my mouth is moving, but I'm not making any sense to them. Yeah. And that's the sad thing about it is there's no, they, they're unable to uh, 
realize, well, here's the logic of it. And, and, and I understand where they come from. They want to be compassionate. They see a person dying or sick or without education. They say, well, we have to provide education. But my question is, if you say you're going to give health care to somebody or education to someone, where are you going to get that from? Yeah. Are you going to go to, and this is exactly the good tomorrow, sorry. Are you going to go to your neighbors and beat them up and say, you got to, for, and they're like, no, no, we all have to contribute. Yes, we will contribute. And do you know, Americans contribute the most amount of money than anywhere else. And the government is the worst when it comes to providing services because the government costs six times more than the church. If the government takes care of a poor person, it'll cost them six times more what it would cost if the church took care of a poor person. I'll give you a, a simple example. Just recently, there was an ad in our, um, that I got in the, in, in the mail and it was from our group here called City Team. And City Team had on it says it cost the city between forty to sixty thousand dollars to take care of a homeless person. It cost City Team twelve thousand hmm. dollars. Now, we had, I have an organization called the VAC. Uh, we just had Dr. Simone Gold speak for us uh, this last Sunday. Um, and if you want to go, go to VAC.org and you can find information about it in the old events. Um, but. So we had the mayor speak for us. And when the mayor was not a Christian, he, he then he was kind of, you know, we have people of all sorts of come speak because we want people to engage with them, ask them good questions. So the mayor shows up and, and I asked him this question. I said, you know, what does I saw this ad? What do you think? And he said, Where did you get those numbers from? Right? 46,000. Well, it turns out the guy who wrote the ad was sitting in the audience. <laughs> and he raises his hands and says, oh, we got it from the city, the city website. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I, so I asked him again, I said, he said, well, no, no, I'll have to look into that. Why is it so much? And then, and then when I, later on, when talking to the guy who wrote the ad, I, he said, we well, you know one thing I forgot to put in the ad is after we, you know, the city spent six, it actually turns out, he said the city spent 67,000 on a homeless person. And after we spend that 67,000, the next year they'll spend it again. And that's for crime, mm -hmm. that's for police, that's for emergency mm -hmm. services, that's for all that stuff. Um, but when city team spends twelve thousand dollars, and not a dime of that comes from the government, when the city team spends twelve thousand dollars, that person is off the streets. The government is just inefficient. They are not very yeah. good at what they do, right? And so, no. socialism it's, just doesn't work for so many reasons. Anyway. No, and they and the waste, and they take taxpayers' money. And uh, I I see uh, this week. Uh, that Mr. Biden is proposing another six trillion dollars of spending, and it's like yep. you're pulling this water, this money out of the air, flooding like water with no consequences uh, to the yep. country. And it's 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 uh, very uh, now I wouldn't say scary as a Christian, but you know what I mean. For the United States, is very bad, um, yep. so and, and we'll pay a consequence for all this spending. Well, there's two things that's going to happen. One, you're taking money from people who are working hard, so you're disincentivizing. Yes, that's hard. right. That's the first thing. Secondly, you're going to a lot of rich people are going to hire start hiding their money, right? You know, if I always say, you know, the rich don't pay taxes, they just because they have accountants. Yep. Like, if you're making a million dollars a year, it's worth paying an accountant thirty thousand dollars to hide your money. If you're making thirty thousand dollars a year or fifty thousand dollars a year, you still get taxed, but you're it's not worth your money to hire some user. To try yeah. and move around. So, I mean, there are so many innovative ways that the rich have designed to hide their money. So, it's so the rich are not going to pay taxes. The poor are going to end up paying them on the birds. So, that's the first thing. One, the taxes are going to go up on everybody. And second, though, here's what's going to happen they're going to inflate the currency, right? The more money you print, the more debt you get into your inflation. Well, what's that? That's a tax on people on fixed income. You're retired, you're on social security, you're on whatever it is that you are. Uh, you're on a fixed investment. Well, guess what? Biden just came in and inflated your, your, the money. So that means that the $1,000 a month you're getting is now only worth the equivalent of $800, right? Uh, guess what? He's just forced uh, an oppressive uh, devaluation of poor people's money. So the poor suffer in each case. Yeah, this is sad. Now, uh, Neil, you're an evan evangelical minister of the gospel. Would you explain uh, what Christian apologetics is? Okay. Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, apologetics is the defense of Christianity using facts, reason, science, philosophy, history, and archaeology, and a bunch of other things. So basically, it, my ministry is called No Blind Faith, noblindfaith.com, noblindfaith.com. And uh, the principle there is that your faith should never be blind. And you can ask yourself this question quite simply. Um, I grew up around the world. I grew up amongst Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists and uh, 
you know, Parsis, Zoroastrians, basically. And I asked myself, why should I be a Christian and not one of those? Because they have faith in their religions as strong as I do. If faith is all that counted, then why isn't their religion? In fact, we think of the Muslim hijackers of 9-11. They had more faith in their God to do what they were doing. They were willing to go outside their, their, uh, outside of their comfort zone to kill people. Yeah. We're not willing to go outside our comfort zone to save people. In many yeah. cases, right? mm -hmm. So why is their faith not more valid than ours? Obviously, the, the measure of the intensity of faith is not what counts. What counts is the validity of your faith. You have faith in the right thing, the right person, in mm -hmm. the right God. Uh, and so, therefore, you have to be able to prove your faith is not mine. And, un and fortunately, uh, Christianity is the only religion that proves itself with facts, history, logic, and, and, you know, and I believe I can show that it makes more sense to believe that God exists using science. I believe that I can show that the Bible has been accurately transmitted over the 2,000 years. I can believe I can show that Jesus Christ was a real human being. He really existed. He really died. And I believe that I can show that he really rose from the dead. The most logical conclusion from all the data is that he physically rose from the dead, proving that he was God because he claimed that I was going to die and rise again. And therefore, that all follows that Jesus Christ then said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. For God to love the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And so you have to believe in Jesus. And that's the evidence that your faith is based not, and you're not having faith in, uh, in that God exists. You know God exists. You're having faith in God, right? I have faith in my wife. I, I'm not sitting here going, oh, does my wife exist? Does she not exist? I have blind faith in my wife. No, I have faith in her and who she is. And you should have faith in God in who he is, not whether he exists or not. Not whether Jesus is God, but whether he is, and I mean, not whether Jesus existed, but whether he is God. That's what you should have faith in. And, and that can be proven throughout, uh, through history and science. And for remember, the demons know God exists. Yeah, and they tremble. <laughs> <laughs> yes, amen, amen, thank you. But that's what now, apologetics is. And apologetics is the defense of the faith. Uh, those, if you want to look it up, it's, it, it sounds like you're apologizing, but it comes from the word apologia, which means to defend. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, um, now you and Kevin um, McGarry, and I interviewed Ke Kevin last week, founded Every Black Life Matter as a counter to Black Life uh, Matters. You know, would you tell us who BLM is, this the organization, and right. is your organization having success countering their evil agenda? Well, so BLM, as most of you know, showed up yeah. yeah, I mean, they started in 2014, but we, they really made headway in 2020 when they were burning down cities with Antifa, right? Yes. And, and they were not helping. And their whole thing is Black Lives Matter. And their whole fo focus was on uh, officers who had shot, you know, individuals that... Um, and, and so their whole thing was nobody cares about Black Lives. So they came up with this agenda. And if you go to their website, and now they've changed it, but we have copies of it. Uh, it would say things like, we're against the nuclear family, we're against the hegemony of the male hierarchy, the patriarchal hierarchy. We're, we're basically, we're socialists, we're, um, we're for uh, minimum wage laws, we're for, you know, and you just go down the line. And, and, and then when you listen to them, they say, well, we're trained Marxists. Yes. The founders say, well, you know, we're trained Marxists. And, and then also Abraham Hamilton, my friend from American Family Association, did an uh, expose on them uh, on his show, showing that they were actually practicing witchcraft. Right? Mm. So when you say, say the name, say the name, that's all witchcraft. And, mm. and they showed them sitting in, in a position, absorbing the spirit of the dead person. And it was just kind of freaky stuff, right? Oh, yeah. so, um, mm. so my wife was uh, talking to our neighbors one, uh, some of our friends uh, one day, and she said, wow, they just went to a BLM rally. And we're like, wait, they're Christians. And she said, yeah, but they were told silence is violence. So if you don't say anything, you're a racist. If you do say the wrong thing, you're the racist. The only right thing is you have to go out with BLM and, and wave banners, and then wow. that proves you're not a racist. Mm. So she said, but they don't understand that BLM is all the bad things. Mm. You need an alternative. So I called up Kevin. I said, Kevin, you know, you're part of the Frederick Douglass Foundation. And I said, you guys should start 
uh, an organization to counter this. And so Fred, uh, Kevin said, yeah, that's a good idea. Calls up Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass says, we're so busy right now because it was the middle of the election season. Um, <clears throat> we're so busy right now. You and Neil should start it. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> calls me up and says, I think you, you and I have to start something. I'm like, well, I'm not African-American. He goes, no, but you're African. I said, yeah. I, know. I said, I'm not black. He said, no, but you are African-American. I said, well, okay, technically, yes. <laughs> he said, you're in. <laughs> so we started and then we said, well, what are we going to call it? And we knew we had to call it something very similar to Black Lives Matter because that's the lane they're in. And if you want to engage with them in the same way, you've got to be running alongside them. So do Black Lives Matter? Yes. And so we said, well, what kind of Black Lives are they interested in? Well, they apparently are not interested in Black Lives because they're burning down Black businesses, right? They're burning yeah. down Black storm. They're burning down Black communities. I'm like, how come they're not going to those rich white communities and burning them down? Because then they know they get shut down. The fact that they're in downtown where very few people live or they're burning um, in you know, the Black communities, that's why nobody's going to help them. And so we said, so the reality is that they don't care about every Black life. No. So we said, we have to call ourselves every Black life matters. And so it's very similar, but the difference is we are looking at every single. And so the first thing that we said is, well, we've got to be pro-life. Well, why? Because then here's the statistic. It's really shocking. Uh, there are 45 million African-Americans in the United States today. Right? 45 million, that's what it is. Did you know that 21 million African Americans were killed in the womb? 21 million to abortion. Okay. Yeah. That means there would be 50% more or 44% more mm. African Americans alive today if it hadn't been. Now, you talk about Black Lives Matter. Why don't those Black Lives, those babies, Black Lives Matter? You know, you, you're, this is a genocide of people. If anyone came in and said, we're going to kill 50% of the entire population of mm -hmm. one, uh, one ethnicity, that's called genocide, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, how horrible can you be just to ignore that? But no, but in BLM's statement, they say, we, we believe in reproductive rights. Well, what's reproductive rights? That's the code word for abortion, right? And if you talk, if you look at Planned Parenthood, they were founded by a racist Margaret Sanger, and they're mm -hmm. predominantly placed. So we were talking to an a African American pastor um, who lived in Chicago, and he says, "I want to know why all the abortion centers for Planned Parenthood are in black neighborhoods in Chicago." Yes. Right? Why are they mm -hmm. not in the white neighborhoods? Right? <laughs> you know, why are they actually in the black neighborhood? So, because uh, they're targeting that. So that's the first thing. And then we decided that look. Uh, the reason why African-American communities are in the situation they are, and there is, and so some people say, well, why, why didn't you say every life matters? Well, because this is an issue of focusing on the fact that the African-American communities are in a certain plight. That's different. I mean, you can go to the Chinese communities, you can go to the Indian communities, you can go, uh, but the specific African-American. Now, notice there's a difference between Nigerian-Americans and Ghanaian-Americans, because they, when they come here, they actually do quite well. In fact, Nigerian Americans and Ghanaian Americans actually are doing far better than many white ethnicities, right? But if you look at the African American community, they're right at the bottom. Why are they so low? And people say, what's well, racism? No, it's actually a targeted, well, it is racism of sorts. It's targeted by the government. They were targeted by the government for two things. One, abortion. Two, uh, and I say targeted by the government, time by Planned Parenthood, but targeted for the second thing they were targeted by the government was welfare. They went in and they made sure that every African American family in those communities got welfare. But here's the condition: yes. if you wanted more money, you could not have a man in the house. Yes. Yeah. If you go back to the 1930s, and I have pictures of this, we we did a little book called called "Does Every Black Life Matter?" And it's a primer I did with my daughter, <laughs> my eight-year-old daughter, and it's 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 a, it's written for kids. But a lot of parents that we've talked to have really enjoyed it and they loved it. So we went through and we, we talk about back in the 1930s, during the worst time of the, of the uh, racism and Jim Crow laws, African-American families were intact. So what you had is if you went in there and you looked at uh, the family, if you went down to the African-American communities, you'd see fathers sitting on their porches, you'd be fathers playing with their kids, you'd see fathers taking walks in the evening after they came back. And yeah, they were discriminated, they were uh, paid less, all these things were going on, but they were intact and crime was very low. Now fast forward down back to the 70s and suddenly LBJ, Lyndon Johnson is now sending people yeah. money and they're like, hey, 
Uh, if there's no man in the house, you get more money. So guess yeah. what? Over time, men leave. 75% of all African-American households have no father living in the home. Yeah, we're paying a price for that today, you know? And it's, right. it's, 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 very, and it's very sad. And I, I know, you know, Black, well, you know, history very well that, you know, the Black Wall Street, how successful- Yeah, it was, was destroyed by them, yeah, yeah. So they were targeted and killed. Now, yes. but, but the sad thing is after the civil rights, there was then a targeting of them. So basically, I mean, was it done on purpose? I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to say LBJ was an evil person or anything. He was a racist. We know that. But yeah. was he in specifically going after? Do you think of long term cost? I don't know. But it's what happened. And so what's happened now is when you have seventy five percent of kids in those inner cities. And notice I say inner cities, right? It's not. This is not happening with families that are middle middle income people, because uh, they're not on welfare. So those inner city families, uh, 75% of those kids are growing up without fathers. So guess what that leads to? We know that leads to more suicide. We know that leads to gangs. We know that leads to drugs. And as a result of the gang suicide and all that stuff uh, and the drugs, you get very bad inner city schools. The schools are fighting, you know, they're basically, they're, they're not learning anything in those schools because the gangs are inside the schools. Their they're fellow students are part of the gangs, right? And people are getting recruited in the gangs at the age of 11, 12, 13, right? So where are they gonna learn? So they're getting a bad education. They've got no father, they've, they're in violence. They've got a criminal record now because the police are after them. Uh, the African-American community in those inner cities are suffering specifically because of those things. So what do we do? Well, the way we solve the problem is we've just first got to solve the fatherless problem. So one of our initiatives is fatherhood initiatives, right? The other one is um, uh, educational choice, right? Because <laughs> you want the kid 70% of African-American parents want their kids to get a voucher so they can go to a different public school or a different school, a private school. But the school unions won't let them. Certain, you know, certain political parties won't let them, but they won't pass those laws. Every time those voucher systems have been passed, African-Americans have blocked them because now they're getting the education they need. And without that education, they can't go anywhere. In fact, they, what happens is when these kids go to these vouchered schools, they get great educations, they, they get jobs, they come back and the money comes back to their community, right? This is what we should be doing. Instead, we're sitting here saying it's all about racism. No, it's all about government policy. Because I tell you what, I, I might go to a store and the guy doesn't want to hire me. I don't want him to hire me, right? I'll, I'll start my own. And that's what the Chinese did. You know, when the Chinese came in the 1800s, um, they said they were discriminated. Yeah, so they said, okay, we'll start our own Chinatown. We'll start our own businesses. We'll start, and now Chinese are some of the richest people in America, right? Now, yeah. unlike the Chinese, though, the African Americans were targeted. You know, the Wall, the Black Wall Street was burnt down, and all these things. But the difference was the Chinese didn't get hooked into that welfare system. And so these are the kind of things that we have to talk about. And BLM standing and say we don't like nuclear family, we don't want school choice. I mean, they don't say that specifically, but you know they don't want school choice. Yeah. Yeah, and that and that's pretty sad, Neil. And and the thing is, is Who's paying the price? Our children are the ones paying the price, yeah, and exactly. because they don't want our children to be educated, and you know, sometimes when we say that, our own people don't believe that. And, yeah, and, I mean, if you think about it, who who would be so evil to not want our kids to be educated? Yeah, right? I mean, even, yeah. let's say that I made money. I was a school teacher, and my wife used to be a public school teacher, right? So I understand this thing. Let's say I made money of that. And they said, look, if you give vouchers, your, your wife might lose her job. I'm like, yeah, but if the school system she's in is failing, then she's not helping anyone. You're, you go through your whole life and all you do is make a paycheck? No, as a school teacher, you want to go your whole life saying you made a difference in someone's life. Yeah, yeah that's it. That is it in a nutshell. As, at least that's what it should be. Now, uh, Neil, would you share just briefly about the critical race theory? And I know that's a mouthful right there because, and, and we know the dangers that is, that's facing our country because of critical race. Everything is racist. Everything is racist. You're yeah. racist. Our military is being destroyed. Schools, our civ everything is about race. And it's all deliberate. And, and people have just been manipulated by this critical race stuff. Yeah. So <clears throat> critical race theory was, okay, remember I mentioned the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School back in the 1930s in Columbia University, uh, what they decided that there was a couple of tenants they had of Marxism they had to push in. And so critical race theory comes out of a, a concept of liberation theology. Liberation theology was founded in, um, in South America 
by Jesuit priests. And his idea was that capitalism was bad. And you have to understand his viewpoint. His viewpoint was um, all these uh, crony capitalists. The crony capitalists is when the government works with rich people to take over the market and to monopolize the market. So he was seeing a bunch of banana republics, you know, fascist dictators running the show and then using corporations to, to take control. So basically what it is, is I'm rich, I'm a rich dictator, I'm a dictator, I want to get richer. I go to a company and say, if you, um, if you give me, you know, this payback, I will make sure that you have no competition in this country and you have complete control. So they say, oh yeah, sure, that's crony capitalism, right? In America, we don't want crony capitalism, we want free market. We see too many, too much crony capitalists, we're seeing that right with big pharma and things like that. So he comes up with this concept of liberation theology is where that Jesus came to save the oppressed. Now, Jesus did come to save the oppressed, but he saved, came to save them from sin. But as a consequence of him coming to save us from sin, we as Christians should reach out to the oppressed because the Bible says we're supposed to take care of the poor and the widows and the orphans, right? So as a consequence of that, we're supposed to take care of the poor. But what this uh, liberation theology does, it kind of skips over Jesus came to save us and goes through Jesus came to save the oppressed, right? So now it is, the church is all about saving the oppressed. Well, that was adhered by the Marxists and the socialists, and that becomes what we know as critical theory. And critical theory basically says if you're oppressed, then you have higher moral standing than your oppressor. But now it expands into critical race theory, which says if you are a race that has been oppressed, then you have higher moral standing than a race that oppressed you. <laughs> So what critical race theory basically says to us today, and the short and long of it is, if you're white, you're evil. If you're black or brown, you're not evil. It's as simple as that, right? Uh, and yeah. it's just devious and horrible about that. I mean, remember Martin Luther King, I have a dream that they might show yeah. on the content of their character, not on the color of their skin. Well, here it is, not only you judge on the color of your skin, you're judged on what your grandparents did. In fact, in many cases, it has nothing to do. Just the fact that you're white, I mean, many Americans today aren't. I mean, they're, if, you, if you're an immigrant from England, you didn't own slaves ever, you know, especially if you're in the peasant class in England, you never own slaves. But here you're considered to be a slave owner. Yeah, yes, there were slave owners. Yes, they were wrong. But that doesn't mean their grandchildren should be held to account for that, right? especially if their grandchildren hasn't gained anything from it. And now they'll say, yeah, you people have gained stuff, you know, you're the oppression kind of, but that's not true at all. Because if, if, if that oppression helped America, it's going to help everybody now, right? As long as you're not, you know, if you're not being forced by the government to take welfare, right? Or uh, uh, to kick your father out of the house. So critical race theory basically is a very evil thing. And, and it, the sad thing about it is it's, think it's seeping into churches. Yeah. But understand, this is another gospel. And the yeah. Bible is very clear. Paul is very clear. If somebody preaches a false gospel, another gospel, they're an anathema. They're cursed. Right? Yeah. And so if you adhere to critical race theory, and, and, and the idea here is that, uh, and here's the danger of critical race theory. You can't do any, if you're white, you can't do anything to fix it. Yeah. You're just guilty. So you can say you're sorry, but that doesn't fix it. That means you don't reconcile. Even after somebody has said, I'm sorry, even somebody has said he's apologized, whatever, you're not reconciled. You as a, so uh, uh, you as a oppressed person, of an oppressed race, uh, you then are automatically superior to them, and it, and it just goes downhill from there, right? Yeah. At what yeah. point do white people say we've had enough of this, right? Yeah. Uh, and then that's how you get, you know, white supremacy groups and all that because they're like, we've had enough. We've got to do a counter movement, and that's the dangerous thing I see. I see it uh, dangerous for my kids, for your kids, for everybody. Yeah. Um, if you start pushing white people against the wall, when they haven't had a racist thought in their mind, maybe they've, you know, slightly ethnocentric or something, but they haven't had a racist thought. Something pushing them to the wall, they will become racist. And I think that's yeah. very dangerous, right? Yeah, and, I don't and, that's, that's, and that's the danger, Neil. Yeah, that's the danger in the whole thing. And, uh, and Lord help, you know, I pray every day for our police because I wouldn't want to be a police today, you know, Neil. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't want to be a police officer uh, because it seems like our black lives don't matter unless they're killed by a, a white police officer. Especially. Right, yeah, yeah. And then we can kill each other every single day, Planned Parenthood, in the womb, murdering each other in all these cities across the right. country. Nobody says a word, even about our little black babies that are yeah. killed, little three-year-old. 
killed yeah, on his God, birthday. God, God, like, seven year old girl shot going through McDonald's with her dad. Those lives don't matter. So many thousands and thousands of black lives are taken and nobody gives a rip about those lives being taken unless they're taken by a white police officer. And, and we just have to speak the truth. Y'all, people may get mad because you said it, but no, we have to tell the truth. And our people have to wake up and say, that's not right. It shouldn't and even we, be about yeah. you know race or, or color of the skin, Should, shouldn't matter. I just say, Martin Luther King, content of character. That's what we should be facing things on, not the color of the skin. All that yeah. does is divides us, makes us hate each other. And we know who the, the author of that is, our enemy. We, we all have an yeah. enemy, Satan. Yeah. And that's what he wants to do. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy and, and, and divide. And that's what he's doing today, causing and, these divisions. But we don't have to put up with it, though. Right. Well, no, and, but the thing is, it is it is seeping into the church, right? The church is... Yes. It, and and the, the, the sad thing about the critical race is it's making races of our kids. Yeah. They're keeping it to kids. Like, I know when I grew up, I grew up in Africa. I didn't know the difference between the Sudanese kids and me and the and any other kids, right? I, I thought we we're all the same. Uh, it didn't make a difference to me. In fact, I was just talking to somebody the other day, and she said that they have uh, their cousins are adopted from Africa, right? And we, you know, in our family, we have uh, adoptions. Uh, we have a gorgeous little girl from Ethiopia who is part of our family, um, and. Nobody knows the difference. You can't tell the. I mean, you can tell the difference, but no, none of the kids know the difference. Yeah. We're all they're just our cousin, right? They don't distinguish where they're from or anything. So, so they start having these critical race theory discussions in school, and this little boy comes home and says, um, starts having the discussion. So the mom says, "Well, I better start talking about his cousin," and he says, "Well, you know that your cousin is black," and the son says, "No, he's not." <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, you know, basically saying not, and then he says, "Well, you know, you're white," and he says, "No, I'm not," <laughs> you know, because <laughs> he had no concept of color, right? It's like, it's, what do you mean, white? Looks white, and or black on a whatever, right? And he's not black; he's brown. He's not, you know, it's like this. Kids don't think that way, right? Yeah. They're like, well, no, they so don't. why are you teaching them this, right? Why are you teaching them this? And yeah. critical race theory says you got to teach the kids. And the white kids have to know that they're racist because they're white. And the black kids need to know that they were oppressed because they're black. And they're like, what, for a six-year-old, this is not something they should be learning. No, no, not, not at all. Not at all. It's very, very sad commentary on those who push this kind of stuff. You know, yeah. I, I got so much I want to talk to you about. but Sorry, I, wanna... I take too long on my answers. So. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'm enjoying it. But I want to ask you about one thing you had in your resume. And one of the... Uh, one of the focuses is to get the Reynolds versus Sims, 1964, oh. and the Baker versus Carr, 1962, uh, and Westbury versus Sanders in 64. You want to get those overturned in the Supreme Court, and you feel that this is the only way to protect the conservative states from going liberal, from the mass exodus from the liberal states. You know, what are the chances, uh, Neil, of this proposal actually making it to the Supreme Court, and, and, and how soon? with that happen? Well, so this is, yeah, this is something, so um, we, we live in California. And if you look at California, there's really, California is controlled by three hubs, the San Francisco Bay Area, LA, and San Diego. And San Diego less, but these three hubs are the most liberal and the, pop, and the population of these three hubs overwhelm the population of the rest of California. But once you get south of uh, the, uh, I mean, sorry, east of the foothills here in Santa Clara, it's all conservative but it's sparsely populated. So what's happening is these population centers are running the entire state. So California is liberal only because of these three population centers. Same thing in Washington. In Washington state, uh, nine counties overwhelm the other 30 counties or something like that, right? So this is Oregon too. Uh, only Portland, <laughs> you know, and maybe Eugene is liberal. Everybody else is conservative. So what's happening is that, um, and then as they do these, uh, they, they run their, uh, stupid program, people flee the state. I mean, California lost a million people, right? In fact, they lost house seats this time, this year, right? They lost three house seats or something like that. Mm. Because people were leaving California and they went to Texas and other places, right? So Texas gained house seats and things like that. So the problem though is as these people move to Texas or they move from where they're going to start bringing their liberal policies and they'll yeah. vote for the same stupid things that they voted for yep. in their old state. And so their new state becomes liberal. 
And so then they take over the capital and then they take, you know, their sense. So I said, wouldn't it be nice that we, if we could stop them? So as you know, in the federal uh, House and Senate, or in the U.S. Capitol, House and Senate, the Senate, every state has two senators, right? It doesn't matter if you're California with 34 million or you're with Montana with 400,000, you still get two senators. And that was designed by the founding fathers because they wanted every state to have the ability to counteract other states. And, and so that uh, there'll be a balance by states. Because remember, we are a United States. We're not one country, we're a union of states. And we should never forget that, even though we try to make it one country, because that's dangerous. Every state has to be independent, has to have their own abilities to make their own laws. And state law should actually be higher than federal law, but, except when it comes to rights, and that's a different argument. So. Uh, so I thought, wouldn't it be great if every state, um, like the states have two senators and, the, uh, and, and then the House has representatives. So in other words, if there's a million people in your state, you get more representatives than in a state that has less, and that's fine. But when you get to the Senate, it's just two. So therefore, even though the bulk of the people may vote for bad things, the Senate can then veto, uh, the, veto those bad things. Make sense? So it's equal representation. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if counties could do that? So in, if that would happen, then in, uh, in Washington state where, uh, well, I, or let's say California, California where like six counties run the rest of our country, or control the rest of the county. If every county had one Senator in their local capital. So in Sacramento, if every county had one Senator, now they're allocated almost the same. They're in fact, like it has no difference. They have representative, the house of representatives is, is a portrait according to how many people there are. But the Senate in, in, the, uh, in, in Sacramento is also proportionate to how many people there are. And, and I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but like for instance, for every um, 300,000, you have one representative in the House. And then for every 3 million, you have one representative in the House, in the Senate, not 3 million, it's, it's, it's probably 600,000, right? You have one representative in the Senate. So proportional representation in both. I said, wouldn't it be nice if it was like the states uh, where, every county had one senator. Then LA County with 4 million people would have the same number of votes as Alpine County with one, with 400,000, uh, sorry, with, yeah, with 400,000 uh, voters. Cause then it would balance out. And then all the conservative states could pr prevent the, sorry, conservative counties could prevent the liberal counties from overriding their vote. So I thought this is great. We should try looking into how to do that. And mm. then I started reading up on it and I realized that before the 1960s and 70s, that was how it was all over the United States. Every county had one representative in the Senate and the state had proportional representatives in the House. That's how it was that. So every county, just like we are a United States, the state were United counties. Right? Think of it that way. Every county had their own representation. Well, and I was like, well, why did it change? Well, in 1967 or something, this Reynolds was thin, was a lawsuit passed by liberal people and it went to a liberal court. These are the same people who later on passed Roe v. Wade, right? They mm -hmm. decided they want to make their own yep. law. And so they said it was unconstitutional for our counties to be represented in their Senate the same way that our states were represented in our Senate in the U.S. Capitol. Do you understand what's going on here? Basically, and this is kind of complicated, but basically the House, um, sorry, the Senate in the counties, they said were different from the Senate in the state. Mm -hmm. Well, that's nonsense. Because <laughs> the Constitution says you can have two representatives per state in the Capitol. Why would it be unconstitutional when the Constitution says that specifically in the Senate? And what this would do is that means when, let's say, people start flooding into, uh, let's take Idaho, right? Um, people are flooding now from California to Idaho. Well, they're all going there and they're all going to create, uh, they're going to end up taking out the, the House and the Senate. But if they had this in place, it didn't matter. Most of them will end up in the Boise area. So if they all go to the Boise area, it doesn't matter how many people end up in the Boise area, they will only still have one senator in that state capital. So they won't be able to overwhelm and take over the entire capital. So it stops the state from tanking. Um, and you can, re I, if you go to neilmomandstream.org, I kind of explain this all. It's kind of hard to okay. do it without pictures and all that stuff. 
Yeah. Um, so what are the chances, though, Neil, of that being overturned? Is there any chance of that making it? Is, all it takes is one red state to vote to change, and it will go to the Supreme Court. Oh, OK. So why well, haven't they done one, it? Though? One red state, like Idaho, should say, we should do this before anything happens. We should change the law. As soon as they change the law, there'll be a huge lawsuit. They'll go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is now on our side. The Supreme Court will look at it and go, well, this is a bad ruling, and they'll overturn it. I hope. Do you know, do you know why uh, none of the states have done that? Because they don't know. Well, you know how many people have talked to you about this, and they're like, we never knew. Oh, well, you know what, Neil? You got some work to do. You got to educate all these states. <laughs> I know. That's why I said, introduce me to some senators. I'll talk to them. Introduce oh, me to the senators. Yeah, I don't know. I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. You it's doable, but it's the only way we'll stop our, because all the red states, all I mean, people are fleeing California by the millions, yeah, right? They they're going to red states. They're going to vote for the same stupid thing. Yep. And that and that and that's what's crazy. Why, why would you flee from craziness in one state then you go to the next state and bring your craziness with you and yeah, destroy exactly. that state yeah. So. yeah that's basically it in a nutshell which is very sad now um now i gosh I, I don't know which question to go to because i want to talk to you about so much but but the last question i want to ask you though neil is is there any way to stop the borders from being overrun by people from foreign countries. We know it's it's been, our own government is doing it and they're allowing it, but not letting the, the wall get finished and just letting anybody come in the country. Uh, so how do we hold our own government responsible for the evil that it's committing against its own country? So, you know, as you know, it took me 12 years to become a US citizen. So anytime I see someone, and my sister's been yep. trying to come in, to become a citizen for years. and. We've done all the paperwork and everything, and, and she'll, she'll, she's still waiting. Uh, so when I see people jump to the head of a queue, so to speak, I mean, everybody wants to come to America, and we should welcome immigrants, but we should welcome people who do it the right way. I mean, we should, and I think that, uh, and I think it's funny, though, you know, if, if Mexico, uh, if we had Mexico's policy of immigration, we wouldn't be in this problem. Yeah. And Mexico, Mexico is far stricter on their immigration policy <laughs> than we are, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, they won't let the South Salvadorians come and become Mexican citizens, right? You know, there's, there's a huge disparity there. But how do we stop it under the current? I mean, if we had Trump in place, then it would be stopped. Yeah, right? exactly. People would stop coming and all that. We want people to come, but we want people to come for the right reason. The right way. Right and all that. So, yeah. um, and, and, and I have to be honest, I'm not a big fan of a wall. Uh, not because I don't think it's needed. But I fear that someday down the future, that wall will be used to keep my kids in. Mm -hmm. right? So um, it, it's kind of a <laughs> two-edged sword, right? Yeah. You draw the wall to protect you from the outsiders, where eventually some evil uh, insider can prevent our people from escaping America. So it's, it's one of those things we have to look with caution. <clears throat> but the, the main thing is, I'll tell you how to stop it without any of that. And, and I'm not saying we can do it. With it. Well, there's no way we'll do it with this with this administration. The way you stop it is you say, if you are not a US citizen, you don't get free housing, you don't get free medicine, you don't get free school, and you don't get free hospital citation. That stops everything. Yeah. The only reason they're coming here is because they get that for free. Yeah. Now, if they come here and they don't get that for free, that means they're working for it. Yes. And that's good. If you're working for all those services, if you're working hard, you're doing this. The, the, the way that we see America, it's, it's not a pie that's fixed, it's a pie that grows. The more people putting into our economy, the more builders, the more things, and it grows. And you go, well, they're displacing some workers here. Yeah, they may be displacing workers, but they're doing the work. And so as long as they're doing the work, that pie is getting bigger and bigger. Because the way we look at our life uh, improvement is in goods and services. How many more goods are being produced that are needed? Needed goods, right? I'm not talking about unneeded goods. You know, the government, governments in communist country produce unneeded goods, you know? Uh, so, but, you know, they'll produce ballpoint pens one year and not light bulbs, right? Because right? they have no idea what is needed. So you've got to let the free market economy deliver needed goods. And the people who can't get jobs will go home again. If you can't get a job here, you're going home. But here, if they can't get a job, it's still a value for them to stay here because they're getting free housing, free education, all that stuff. Yeah. 
and especially if you think, hey, oh, by the way, and if our kids are born here, they're going to stay as your citizenship. Yeah. And then they've got free housing, free education, all that. Stuff. Oh. So the, the root of the problem really is all the free stuff. It's all the, the big yeah. magnet draws. And, uh, and how do you stop that? Well, we stop that by stopping. Initially, you stop that for anybody who's not a US citizen. Eventually, I think the church needs to take the place of all the welfare. And the church yeah. can easily take the place of all welfare. People are confused about that. And understand, we spent about $1.2 trillion at the federal level for welfare. Now, remember, I said that the church is six times more efficient. Yes. So we can replace $1.2 billion, sorry, a trillion dollars of welfare with $200 billion of church based welfare. Yeah, I know. Just right. letting the people do it who know how to do it. Right. And, and get the government out of the way. Right. And then when you do that, you can also fire those millions of, I don't know, millions, of, hundreds of thousands of government workers that are doing all those programs, which gives you more money. And you're like, what will they do? Well, trust me, we will find jobs for them. Because when you take that money and put it back in the economy, the economy booms. Yes. Right? When you start, every time you take a dollar out of the economy for taxes and it goes to something that is of no value, guess what? The economy, because that's capital that's not being used for reinvesting. Yes. So if you start reallocating this, the economy, I mean, America will take off like it did in the 1800s, right? Yeah, but you know what? Unfortunately, it's very sad that there are people that don't want the economy to take off. No, because they want to control it, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's a deliberate effort. And now, Kevin, you have a lot of impressive uh, people who who uh, uh, endorse you. I was looking at Kevin and, and uh, Sam Sorbo and uh, God's Not Dead, because I, I love the Dead God's Not Dead movie series and all, Tim Wildmiller, American Family Association, Tony Perkins and Brad Dacus and Walter Hoy, and Rob McCle just a few of, of your endorsements. I, I think that's uh, very, very impressive in, in your book, uh, Jesus is involved in politics. I know a lot of people say, oh, well, Jesus wasn't political, but can you just, just briefly just talk a little bit about that before we have to sure. shut down? So, um, yeah, so the idea that Jesus wasn't involved in politics is a, is a misunderstanding of history. A lot of people come to me and they say, well, Jesus didn't get involved in Roman politics. Well, he didn't get involved in Roman politics because he wasn't a Roman citizen, quite simply, right? He was a Jewish citizen, he was a citizen of the, of the, 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 you know, the state of Judea. And as a Judean citizen, he would not be involved, allowed to be involved in Roman politics. The Romans were governing Judea, but they didn't run it. It's just like, remember when we were governing Iraq, we didn't run all the local stuff. It's too much work. Everybody, the Romans, just like we in, in Iraq, we would just govern the top layers and then they would do all the bottom layers. So the question is, did Jesus have senators and representatives? Did people make laws in Judea at the time? And the answer is yes, he did. He had a group of people that made the laws. They had a Senate and they had a House of Representatives, the equivalent, and a Supreme Court, all tied up into one. And this, by the way, it's called the Sanhedrin, right? So Sanhedrin would sit together and they were the representatives, the senators, and the judiciary all tied up into one court. So these were the guys, if he wanted to change the laws, he could talk to them. If he wanted to get involved politically, he would talk to them, right? So who are these people? And did he ever talk to them? Did he ever talk to them about political things? Did he ever engage with them? And they're like, well, no, he didn't. Of course he did. Because the members of the Sanhedrin were called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. <laughs> these are God, these are Jesus' representatives and senators. And who is he talking to all the time? He's engaged with them all the time. In fact, they're the primary person he's talking to when, when he's engaging with, with any symbol of authority. And what does he say? And then people say, well, no, no, but he wasn't talking to them about um, political things. He was talking to them about religious things. No, no, he was talking about the law. He was talking about the righteousness. And he said, look, you've forgotten, you've ignored the three most important things about the law. Mercy, justice, and faithfulness. Well, mercy, what? Not God's mercy. Why is he arguing about God's mercy? He's talking about their mercy in their punishments. Justice. God's justice? No, he's talking about their justice in their laws. And then faithfulness. Faithfulness to what? Faithfulness to God's law, because they had the higher law that was the Torah, and they were not being faithful to it. Remember, he says the Sabbath was made for man, not yeah. man for the yeah. Sabbath, but you've mm -hmm. taken that law that God gave you, and you've twisted it and made all these false laws. Oh, you can't do this. You can't take a donkey out of, you know, you can't heal a man on the Sabbath. You can't do all this. He says you've taken God's law, and you've made all these new laws that have nothing to do with God's original law. And what he was, he is what we call a strict constructionist, meaning he says, go back to the original intent of the law and look at what it is. So Jesus was engaged with politics his entire, in, throughout the Gospels, we see that 
And not only that, you can't even preach the gospel without quoting what he said to a senator, to a politician, Senator Nicodemus, right? For God to love the world yes. that he gave his only begotten son, right? You can't even, so he was witnessing to the senators. Why are we not doing that, right? So, so all of a sudden, Jesus was intimately yes. involved in politics. But here's the reason why Christians should be involved in politics. Somebody came up and said, well, I don't think I should be involved in politics. I said, well, okay, I'm glad a lot of people did not have that thing. I said, do you think that slavery is wrong? Of course. Do you think that child labor is wrong? Of course. Do you think that uh, child prostitution is wrong? Yeah. Do you think that temple prostitution is wrong? Yeah. Do you think that we should not be killing twins when they're born? Yeah. Do you think that widows should not be burned at their uh, husband's altar? Yeah. Do you think that prisoners should be treated kindly? Yeah. Do you think that animals should be treated kindly? I said, I do think that we should not have gladiatorial combat. So I started going, and he says, why are you saying that? Yeah, I like, said, well, all those laws were passed by Christians yes. who got involved in politics. How dare you say I'm not going to get involved in politics? So you think that slavery should still be legal? You think that discrimination should still be legal? You think that child prostitution should still be legal? No, if you have any compassion at all, you better be involved in politics. Yeah, don't forget that Jesus didn't come to, he came to die for your sins and save you, and as a result of that, you get involved in politics. Not Jesus came to be involved in politics. He was involved in politics, but he was primarily came there to save us from our sins. And as a result of that, our compassion should lead us to then working for those oppressed and, and doing things in those lives. Amen. So he, he laid the groundwork. Well, Neil, we're going to wrap it up. And uh, I just want to see if you have a final word that you would like to say, uh, how people can contact you. We'll put a lot of information on, on your write up when we. Uh, put the video out for this podcast. Yeah, so, so a couple of things. Go to our website, everyblm.com, everyblm.com, and you can go to my website, noblindfaith.com, and you can find out more information about our ministries and all that. And then if you're interested, if you're in the San Jose area, we invite you to go to bac.org, bac.org. It's our local organization here that we work with, and we have people like Simone Go, Charlie Kerr, uh, even people like Robert Kennedy is coming to speak to us in a couple of weeks. Oh. Uh, a couple of months actually so uh you want to be you want to be part of that and we're leaving, meeting live when simone gold came we had 1800 people at the event mm -hmm. so huge event live no masks i'm sorry if, if you want to wear a mask you're welcome to but nobody else will be <laughs> yeah amen I, I agree with that now i want to thank you thank you for sharing and we'll have to we'll have to meet again one day <laughs> sounds good yeah in person i'm actually in i'm flying to san diego this afternoon Oh, okay, okay, and you'll be here uh, for who are you meeting to, with? Uh, I'm going to Temecula. There's oh. an event at Temecula Town Hall at 7 p.m. Oh, um, okay. I had it up here somewhere, but if you if you're in Temecula area, 7 p.m. will be at Town Hall. Oh, uh, there's okay. a huge event uh, going on. Yeah, and I'm great, going to speak. great. Now, thank you once again. And also to each of you, my audience, I want to thank you for listening and watching each week. Uh, come back. You can contact me at dwsview, stand up at gmail.com. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends. Subscribe to my station, hit the red button so you'll know when the podcasts are coming out. And also would love to have you be a sponsor to this podcast. Don't forget to share. And my word to you today, to dear friends, is to stand up for what's right. And join me next week. We'll have another guest. And guess what, friends? If we do not stand up, we will.